friends, um, as always, thank you for your support, thank you for coming. But I have to say that the exhibition is such an exquisite little exhibition that it's something we're absolutely delighted to share with you. Um, it, uh, you as you know, because it's all in the right, uh, it, it, it's the collection of Omar Khan, uh, who has been uh, chasing postcards for the good part of the last 25 years, I think. And um, when the idea was proposed to us, I just thought it, it had such an incredible synergy with our museum. And you can see how the images are so connected. And, and, and in fact, Rahab, who has curated the, the visual, that sudden visual aspect that you see upstairs, um, he said, we must put one of the cases in, in, the, in the exhibition because you, it's so closely connected. And of course, like the uh, postcard, which was, I think, the 19th, late 19th, early 20th century version of the Instagram today. So that was the, the, the 19th, uh, early 20th century Instagram. And um, our museum and, and a form, an important form, early form of mass communication. Uh, and our museum also, one wouldn't think of it, but the museum is also a form of mass communication. How did you communicate with all these people who um, were not educated and you wanted to get certain messages across to them? And sometimes, if you come and do a walkthrough with our curators, they will point out certain cases to you where there was definitely a political or a didactic message involved. Now, I'm not quite sure, I think we're, we might get into that a little bit, whether there were political and didactic messages involved with postcards as well. Um, but we, you can see uh, how the idea of how the image is connected, how they um, referenced each other, they inspired each other. And so we're really delighted to, to uh, host this exhibition. And uh, Omar has also done a book, and we will do the book launch today. Uh, I would like to just thank HDFC for their generous support of the exhibition, and we will give the first copy of the book we do give a part, who as you know is chairman of HDFC. Um, and, um, and I'd like to now hand it over to, to um, Omar, uh, but also say how wonderful before I do, sorry, one last thing, how wonderful it is to also work again with the al Qasim Foundation uh, and with Raha. Um, uh, we've done several exhibitions with Raha. Uh, I think this is the third one, and, and we're delighted to work with them as well, to collaborate with them. Omar. Thank you, thank you, Christine. Welcome and thank you everybody uh, for coming. First, a couple of thank yous. First of all, thank you very much, Tasneem, for hosting this here at the Baltajilad Museum. It is the most appropriate location, and I thank you for your vision and just recognizing that this was the right thing to do in a way. This is one of the first exhibitions in the world of postcards around the whole country's you know, output, and I know very few other exhibitions, so I think that was a great visionary step. I'd like to thank uh, Raha Alana and the al Qazi Foundation and Mrs. Alana and uh, Mr. al Qazi Ibrahim al Qazi, who founded that unbelievable institution, uh, for curating the exhibition so well and making it look so exciting. Really what we tried to do was give you all some sense of how exciting it was in 1900 to suddenly have postcards appear in the scene. And I really think, thanks to Rahab and the staff of actually this institution and the Al-Qazi Foundation of the Arts, the meticulous work of so many people who put the exhibition together that I think we have succeeded. I used to think a book was a lot of work, but an exhibition might be even more and more painstaking. Uh, and I'd like to thank Vipin Shah, uh, the publisher, and the Al-Qazi Collection of Photography for co-publishing the book. We try and give the entire story and history of it. And finally, I would like to give a very special thanks to Mr. Deepak Parekh for two things. Number one is, 16 years ago when I visited Mumbai for my first book launch, he introduced me to the SNE, and I came here to the museum, and it had not yet opened, actually, it was still being restored, and when the SNE walked me through and was showing me what they were doing, I was like thinking, oh my goodness, this is the perfect place for a postcard exhibition. So it's unbelievable, but 16 years later, it's actually happening, and I'd like to thank... Uh, <laughs> 
And I'd also like to thank HDFC and Mr. Parekh as chairman for their support of the exhibition to make it possible in so many cities and give you the first copy of the book. Thank you so much. In the age of Instagram, we cannot miss the photo opportunity. <laughs> So I wanted to do this evening, uh, and provided I don't speak too quickly, but speak in a way that's clear and comprehensible, is give you a quick tour of the earliest postcards of Mumbai now, or then called Bombay, and just give you a sense of what it looked like a hundred years ago on this new medium. But I thought I would start for a moment by answering a question that Tasneem put to me, which is like, how did you get into postcards? What got you into collecting them? I have a collection of maybe 10 or 20, maybe hitting 20,000 at some point of postcards that I've been collecting for about 25 years. So I live in San Francisco, and I, it was 1995, and I got a brochure that said there's some vintage postcard paraphernalia exhibition in a place called Concord, which is like an hour and a half drive away. And I don't know why, but I went there. And I saw these boxes of India cards. And I found this card, Buddha Baking Bread. And it just jumped out at me, because it reminded me of my grandmother's home in Lahore, her sitting on the veranda with a servant goat girl, you know, making chapatis or getting the dough together, shelling peas, and so forth. And I thought this sort of ability to transport you with a small little tiny image, this was a court-sized card, uh, back to that time many years ago, was to me something really special. So that sort of got me on this sort of collecting pathway. And I have only seen this postcard two more times. So it was a very lucky coincidence to find it. And the story of this postcard takes us back to this city in a second. And I'll come to that in a moment. So to give you a sense of some of the earliest postcards, the earliest known postcards uh, of India are these postcards by the Singer Manufacturing Company from 1892. And they actually show Sing, Singer, Singer is a sewing machine company, so you can see in the next card, they had an advertisement in the back. Singer sewing machines, which every Darzi, you, some of you may remember, has always you know, schlepping around with them. So these cards actually show uh, Mr. Nusarbanji Patel, who was the Singer representative, who was an American sewing machine company. He was the Singer representative here in the city. And this is his family and his Parsi you know, colleagues in the company who all were on this postcard. And it was made for the Chicago World Exposition of 1893. And these are the earliest known postcards of India that I've been able to date, where you have an image on one side and a message or something on the other side. And they're from the advertising industry, because advertising had the money to support the manufacture of postcards, because they were very expensive to make in the early days. This is the earliest known greetings from, which was the first kind of postcard that I know from India. This is 1896. And it was dated because we managed to find out that the company was doing similar cards and the company quickly went out of business. And these are all lithographs, so photographs very carefully printed, and I'll get into that in a moment, how they were actually made. And this is probably the earliest postcard that I know of by an Indian-based publisher. And uh, Werner Rössler was an Austrian or German photographer who lived in Calcutta, Calcutta. And he had these cards printed in Austria. They're all based on photographs that he took. There's one dating that sort of suggests 1895, but I don't believe it, because I think it was actually maybe a mistake, or it's actually 1898. But there are a number from 1897. So you can imagine this is about the earliest time. And this is just when postcards began to become popular. It was around 1895 in Europe that greetings from postcards from hotels and alpine sort of chalets and so forth, suddenly began to be used by them, by those hotels, as an advertising mechanism. So you know, you have a guest come, they'll send a greetings from X place to somebody else. That's a way of getting that person to come next year. And there's a whole, this a whole advertising and viral sense that we even see with social media today that actually began in a sense in those days. And that birth of the postcard, and suddenly going from literally a few million postcards a year produced in the early 1890s to about a billion plus a year in a single country like Germany by 1900. So there was an unbelievable ramp up 
in postcards being exchanged across the world, and there were greetings from India cards sent to places, you know, all over the world, back and forth. And it was this mass explosion of imagery that so interested me, and I wanted to learn more about how people in those days began to experience and see the rest of the world in colored imagery. Because until then, there was no way, actually, in color to see other places, except for a few magazines and journals and paintings, which, you know, very few people actually saw. This was a media, a medium that actually appealed to everybody, and you could send it, so it was the masses suddenly, at all class levels were able to see uh, what a place looked like. And remember, a postcard is sent from one person to another that passes through the hands of a postman, and who knows how many other people in a household or along the way get to see it. So just the way our Facebook posts are open to everybody, in that way also the message of the postcard was open to everybody in those days. These are this is, this is a man called Josef Hoffmann, who's from Vienna. I grew up in Vienna, so it was great for me to do research there. He was, these are the, probably among the very earliest artist-signed postcards of India. He came to India in 1893, 1894. He was a famous Austrian painter, and he made this postcard. This, one, this is out of a series of 12, the one of, uh, of Bombay. This was called Figueri Hini. I don't know exactly where it is anymore, but that's the excerpt. And you can see the beautiful colors that were used. And each one of these lithographs was put through the press 12 times to lay each color on. So you had 12 different stones, each one of these big, massive limestones with one color on it put through a press exactly in this index to get to the right place on an image. So it was a very complicated production process. Where is this? You know, it was called Higeri Lini. Higeri Lini, H-Y-G-E-R-I, which I've not been able to trace where exactly it is. Anybody knows a place called Higeri Lines in Mumbai? Please tell me, I'd love to know more about it. Maybe. Maybe. It could be, perhaps it is. There is a similar image in the Paul Walter collection. What about Okay. Paul Walter collection. Okay. Uh, it's very similar to this. So I think there is Great. a uh, right. thing that we yeah. So let's talk afterwards because I love to track these things down. Thank you so much. Okay. So, just to give you a quick sense, there are four kinds of postcards. And one of the interesting things about this medium is that quality actually went down. So the first kinds are lithographs. And there's a close shot of the Russell uh, Calcutta card you saw before. See how smooth and clear the colors are, even when you sort of get very close? The second type, the color type, quickly replaced the lithograph because it was so expensive to produce lithographs. At the moment it became a mass medium, people wanted to bring the prices down. So instead of 12 stones, you had one piece of glass against which an image was pressed. You got an exposure, you treated it with chemicals, and then you put that through the press, and then you hand colored it later. And it was called a color type. But the thing about a color type is, it actually is very accurate and has a very nice way of depicting something that is photographic. Then you have a half tone where you have the screen method, and you see when you get close up how many dots are here in the image, and you have this panel upstairs in the fourth room as well. It's actually not that great when you look at it. And the half tone is what we have in magazines and in general that we use and see things through today. And the final type is the real photograph, where you actually have a photograph, you have continuous tones, and you can look at things much more clearly then. There were not so many real photograph post, photographic postcards until maybe the 1920s and 30s. It's really nice to find them because when you blow them up, they still look really good because there's a lot of image detail there. But because of pricing pressures, we went from lithograph to color type to half tones in about 15 years from 1895 to 1910. So it is in the earlier years that the postcards are actually even more beautiful often than uh, later on. Not necessarily as interesting, but maybe more beautiful. So let me talk about the Ravi Varma Press for a moment, because really Bombay was the center of innovation in this country for the postcard art, and some amazing stuff was done here. All of you know who Ravi Varma was. He was India's greatest 19th century uh, painter. In 1892, 
Ravi Marma and his brother invested 80,000 rupees, an enormous sum for them, because he would make maybe 1,500 rupees on a painting for a Maharaja, and it would take him a month to make that kind of a painting. So 80,000 rupees, he went into debt to bring a lithographic press over with a whole bunch of German technicians who actually ran the press. And believe it or not, the working language of the press was German. And there were about half a dozen Germans here who ran the press for a long time. His goal was to have his paintings and his images popularized throughout India. And that's where he had the vision to bring the press over. And Gokhale, the independence leader, was another supporter of this because the idea was, let's get as many means of production to produce imagery into the hands of Indians so it wasn't just the colonialists who would control this means of making uh, visual imagery. Now, Paul Gerhardt was the chief lithographer at the press. He was a painter. And these are some of his very early postcards of Elephanta Caves. This is 1899 or perhaps earlier when he was beginning to experiment with using the press to make postcards as they were becoming popular. And just to give you a sense of what the press looked like, uh, this is how a whole press worked. You have somebody sort of standing, the stones would go through. That's a close up of a press on that side. That's Fritz Schleicher, the German who actually ran the press. He ran it for about 10 years. It was always in debt. They finally bought out Ravi Varma in 1903. Uh, and after they bought out the press themselves as, the, as Germans, and Schleicher became the head of the press, they then started mass reproducing Ravi Varma's paintings and became incredibly successful. The press lasted until the 1970s, I think, and uh, took those oleographs, those really big versions that you see of Ravi Varma's paintings all over the place, still all over the country. It was because of the success of this press. But in the early days, uh, they really got into postcards. And these are some of the 1899 uh, postcards made by uh, Paul Gerhardt, where he takes different figures and puts them on the Fisher Woman of, of Bombay. It was a very common scene. You've got a set, you've got a, a dancer, and then, of course, a bisti. Uh, so the different characters he was trying to take, uh, take uh, depict, and this is all, again, lithographs. This is one of my favorite postcards. It's just happy. This is a woman with a scythe. She's just at the harvest. Uh, often in those days, women were depicted as notch girls and so forth. Here's an active, strong woman. You don't want to get in her way, she's got a weapon in her hand. <laughs> Happy is a great word to depict you know, a certain emotion, but it also speaks to the multi sort of cultural nature of the postcard. Because it could be Happy Diwali, Happy New Year, Happy Christmas. They actually said Happy Christmas in those days. Happy Eid, Happy Navros. You could add whatever you wanted to it. These, these were meant for holiday. So immediately the postcard was being used by many communities uh, for whatever purpose or holiday they wanted to use it for. And this was the ad in, I think it was September 1899, when the Ravi Varma Press got a contract from a Babaji Sakharaman company, a dealer here in the city, to produce one lakh postcards for 1,000 rupees. And that's how the first Gerhard cards were then manufactured and then so on as the Times of, of, of India had. And you know, they advertise this the first time in the country uh, that we have you know, indigenously produced postcards. And these are, I just give you a couple more views of the city uh, by Paul Gerhardt, very interesting. And, you know, this, this view of Back Bay was very common, became very common later, but Gerhardt was such a genius in a way that, you know, he puts two people up there and they, you know, they're talking, they're saying something, they draw you into the postcard, they make you sort of have a little bit of an engagement with it as opposed to just seeing a flat image. And I think that's part of what made him such a successful artist. And this is another uh, you know, postcard again from that same series. This is another one uh, from looking into the bazaar. And this is uh, then referred to as Bori Bandar Station. And the message, if you look at the side, is magnificent station, but far too big for requirements. <laughs> so <laughs> I think they've changed a lot. Uh, it's you know, one of the busiest railway stations in the world today. And this is from 1899, this postcard. And this I show you of women making bread. Now, there were a number of these postcards which are not signed. They were, I'm sure, produced at the Ravi Rama Press because they're the right size. I think this was Paul Gerhardt experimenting with different forms. But again, you can see the lovely color treatments, uh, you know, the great sort of sense of artistry in making such a tiny object. These were very small uh, cards compared to the later cards that took over. 
And then these are some of the postcards of Ravi Varma's paintings, some of his most famous paintings. And these were around 1905. And even though the press produced all the large oleographs and the 16 by 20 size images here in India, it already was much more economical to send these cards and these images to Germany when they were produced and then sent back to India. And you just have to imagine for a moment how a postcard like this worked. You might have a photographer in Delhi or Jaipur make an image. He would send that photograph to a printing press or a producer in Germany. They would produce the postcards in batches of two or 3,000, send them by ship all the way back to India. They'd be sold to a tourist or somebody else you know, outside the Havamaha or somewhere in Jaipur, who would then send that card over to somebody in England. So you know, two or three times it would crisscross. And then I would buy it in San Francisco. It'd be sent over again to me 100 years later. So it's a very, you know, very multinational product that really exchanged hands many times. And that's one of the things that interests me about postcards. And these are a few more. This is Shakuntala, I think one of the most famous images uh, of Ravi Varma, again on a postcard. Uh, and this is Hanuman on the side, Victoria of Indraji, and uh, you know, Damayanti and Mohini. I mean, this is just all uh, some of the you know, more famous postcards of him. Now, the other thing to sort of note about postcards, the thing that sort of made them take off are the greetings from the postcard, that concept of sending a postcard from a place to say hello to somebody uh, and sort of draw them into that place. This is a very early uh, Bombay card with a message. Uh, I think it's in French, sent, and it says, you know, again, a view of back bay, very nicely done. This was actually done by an Italian company, a one-off. I think Gerhardt may have designed it, but I'm not sure, because it's got his palm trees in front. That was one of his standard uh, sort of signatures. Uh, this is a, a greetings from Bombay card from 1903 by D. Macro Polo and Company. They were a big uh, tobacco dealer, both here and in Calcutta. And of course, tobacco dealers sold anything they could, so they sold postcards as well. This one is in the book, but I think this one is not. This is looking towards Flora Fountain. And you know, the design elements in these cards and the care with which people took photographs, put them up, created a sense of movement, the scroll going down, you know, the man standing there looking over with you, sort of joining you as a viewer. It's all you know, a high level of art and something that is, I think, in many ways much more sophisticated than just a photographic postcard, where you don't have to add much to it uh, the way these people did in the early days. And these are from around 1903. This is a black and white card, multi-view card, with many different uh, sort of images on it in the city and the Taj Hotel. And these are, so the Taj Hotel opened in 1904, and it is also one of the sort of factors that led to the rise of the postcard from the city, because all the visitors had postcards, they sent postcards back. And I, in particular, like to just collect cards sent from the Taj Hotel with messages on it, and I have about maybe two dozen at this point. I'd love to get 100 one day, put them all together, and compare messages uh, that people sent around that time uh, from the hotel. And here is another, this is again a lithographic, uh, sort of one to do with it, trying to cram as many images into one card as possible. And this is a hand painted card uh, from around 1903. So you even had in the bazaar people hand painting cards here with salams. And uh, sometimes, you know, you're not sure if these cards are real or not, but I've seen them in Royal Windsor Castle, dated from 1903 or 1904. I have enough dated. Uh, actually from that time that I'm sure they are authentic, although today there might be a number of fakes on the market as well. The other great firm in this city was called Clifton and & Company, and they produced a number of really uh, very different kinds of cars. On the left is a very early car, and one thing to notice about the early cars is they had a big white space in the front, because that was the space for messages. And you had to write your message on the front of the card because the back was only for the address and maybe a stamp. Other people often like to put a stamp in the front as well. But similarly, that Alfred Stone Stroker card and this other one is actually a Jaipur card. You could put your message on the side. So these are uh, chromo color type cards, so light prints, where they took a color type and then colored it different ways as they put it through the press. So you've got these very subtle effects. Like here you can actually look through and sort of see a sort of a translucent feel. And it was too great artistry to produce these kinds of cards. And you really had to know what you were doing uh, with the press to get this much color in this rich a way uh, on a small piece of paper. 
And here you get a sense of the difference between a black and white card and a color card, and you know how much more color can kind of bring uh, to the experience. And you know, different treatments, different color treatments to exactly the same image. And here you've got a pisty, and you've got you know colored him in different ways depending on the year and the mood. And fashion has changed very quickly. And there was a constant, you know, just like the fashion industry today, people wanted different kinds of postcards as quickly as possible because you want it to be as new. Now, one of the interesting things about postcards is that women were the biggest collectors and recipients of postcards, even in the early days. So if I look through my collection, I once added up like a few thousand cards. How many were addressed to women, how many to men? It's about two and a half times as many were addressed to women as to men. And women are the people who, especially in the West and also here with Parsi and, and Hindu families especially, who put together the postcards in an album and kept them in the parlor and shared them with other people. So mostly when you, you know, buy an album or find an album, it's probably usually signed. It's usually in a woman's name and she's put all the postcards together. One of the big issues facing the city in those days was the plague and you actually had the plague come in by ship from different parts of the world and kill many, many people here. And that, of course, hurt the business community and other people coming. So they had postcards made, which were sent, sent out from the city to assure people that people were taking actually good steps to combat the plague here and actually not so bad. And actually it was, uh, uh, I think it was a Russian immigrant here who figured out the first vaccine against the plague. And we even had postcards used by people to record how many deaths because of the plague and then send them back to central headquarters and you would play sanitariums and, and, and so forth as well, which were depicted on postcards. So in a sense, to Tasneem's question about postcards, I mean, they depicted the good, the bad, the ugly, and many different things could show up on postcards. It wasn't just always, you know, the nicest parts. This is the postcard artist, I think, from India who has most impressed me and I really think was India's greatest postcard artist. And uh, there's a whole room just devoted to him that Himanchu has put together, both with postcards and other images. So M.V. Gurandar was the first Indian head of the J.J. School of Art. This is a man who, from an early age, just painted. He was recognized as a prodigy at the age of, I don't know, 12 or 13. His father died early. Some British uh, people who ran the school brought him in, gave him a scholarship, and he just produced thousands of images in his lifetime, including probably some of the best postcards. This is kind of a malef. He was, he was a parvu from that community. He kind of looked like that, but this is an image of someone there. But every one of his images shows personality. And I think his ability to quickly define line and character uh, is really remarkable. And part of what he did was take the different characters in the city who had come up, because Bombay was such a multi-cultural place. You had people coming from all over India, all over the world, new kinds of people show up, road sweepers, Victoria cab drivers, dog walkers, you name it. There were new characters being created. And it was his job, in a way, uh, just to go and depict them and then create sort of memorials uh, to them, in this case, through postcards. And there's always you know, something subtle, because here you have you know, the most ancient possible art, of course, you know, getting milk. And in the back, you have like a thin veneer of the modern buildings of the city coming up. But still, the ancient tradition uh, continues in the foreground. So these kinds of contrasts that make you think, but also quite lovely to behold, I think are kind of his signature. He produced about 70 cards, and there's always something subtle there. You see, you know, you, you see the Brahmin very slowly inching his way from the temple to the city. Not in a hurry at all. He's a little bit unsure about moving. And you see the Marbaria. He's gung-ho, he's got his book of debts in his hand. You know, he's ready for the urban action. I mean, all these little subtle points, uh, Durandar, I think, captured in great detail. Uh, here you have the Bombay policeman, a very early form. He just carried an umbrella. It's like imagine. And then you have a Marbar. I mean, look how much character she has looking with the city uh, going back behind her. And, and you can see in, in the, you know, Himanchu has put together, he did a book, uh, Women of India, with I think 50 images or so of different women. I mean, he never repeated himself. Even if it was the same character on a postcard and in the book, he always did a different image. He did not you know, cheat in any way. He was so happy to redraw uh, somebody or create something new. And here we have, uh, we have an ayah. We have two Parsi ladies at the seaside, at Malabar Beach most likely. We've got the telegraph. Game. By the way, the bicycle 
was a really new thing, and it was really hip to have a bicycle. So we see a bicyclist, there were actually a number of postcards. And this is Hindu girl of the period. This is a card that I found uh, with a collector in, in, in England. This was actually sent by the runner himself to his former teacher uh, at the JJ School of Art, who had gone back to England and retired. And this showed up, and actually, he sent this card and ended up in auction. And, and uh, Mr. Stokes bought it, and I managed to find it uh, at his house. So you can be sure that this was a card that Durandra would have been very proud of. And it shows, and by the way, the, the cutout of this is upstairs in the hall, uh, which has been blown up. It gives you a sense that he was very proud of this postcard. To send it to his art teacher, he must have really liked this one. But it also shows his sort of you know, careful depiction of how people were changing and the new kinds of new developments that were happening uh, in society. This is one of my favorite cards. This is uh, Amali. And you know, look how he is completely in charge of his environment, having the greatest of times, you know, in the garden. And then you have these beautiful impressionistic type colors coming out uh, from all sides. So you know, a lot of artistry again in these products, and also a lot of subtle social commentary. You've got a converted and unconverted pariah, somebody in a suit, somebody not. You've got a sort of a dig at the Bengali Babu. You know, so he's got he's got his he's got his little messages as well. And this is how the car, the, the last uh, sort of section I'll look at is Raphael Tuck and Sons. So, earliest days of postcards, you had the Germans and the Austrians uh, sort of dominate. And the British were a bit late to catch up to postcards. Uh, and you have many sort of discussions about why aren't the British as into postcards as, as the, you know, the continental Europeans. But when they caught up, they really caught up. So, Raphael Tuck and Sons, because, you know, Britain had such a big empire. So once Tuck came, across, came to the scene, they managed to mass produce cards. And they sort of six or less after the original paintings. And you'll see upstairs we have another envelope blown up where they boast that their postcards are from original oil paintings. What they did was take a photograph and color it and then make a postcard. They're not from actually original oil paintings, but that's, that's OK. Uh, they come in these packets of six, and then they'd be sold. And you could buy them here as well as you could buy them uh, abroad. And I'll give you a few examples of their postcards. Now, one thing you'll know in those days is that people often put the postage stamp in front. And I've not yet decoded the entire language, but the way the postage stamp was put in front often was supposed to carry a message. Like this meant, hello, upside down, upside down might mean I love you, to the side it might mean don't send me any more postcards, another way might mean I hate you. So it is a really complicated messaging, which I've not yet actually decoded, but according to people in those days, uh, there was actually some meaning to the way a stamp was put in front. And this is, uh, this is another street note, the construction on the side of the building coming up with the same sort of bamboo hoardings that you see, uh, scaffolding that you see today. Now this is right near us here in the museum. This is looking towards the observatory. And here I give you, this is the black and white photograph, not an original oil painting. But then when you add color to it in a postcard, it certainly looks uh, maybe a lot more enticing. And this is one of the early tram cars uh, in the city by Downey Street. And here is obviously one of the most famous scenes in the municipal building across from uh, Victoria Terminus. Whoops. And here is another sort of uh, <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to end here. These are two cards by Durandar again, picking out different types on a single card, uh, showing you know different uh, types of women in the city, different types of men, and you know his ability to depict so many of the personalities that made this such a great city, uh, even in those days, uh, I think is, remains amazing. So that's the quick tour that I wanted to give you of the postcards. And I think you have some questions, so let's go ahead. So thank you, Mark, for that tour before. And uh, before Rahab and I interrogate him on the, on the, on the, on this incredible amount of information that he has, I'd just like to invite Deepak Barney to say a few words. He's had a chance now to get a quick glimpse of what's going to be in the book. And Deepak, I'd love to share that with you. Omar, thank you for taking the trouble 
to make us see our own city 100 years ago, how it looked and how it must have felt. You know, I, um, I got involved in this because I go back a long way with Omar's mother-in-law. Mother-in-law was a friend of mine, in fact was a guardian mentor when I was studying in London. She's still around in Chennai, she's not well. And I've seen his wife grow up when she was two years old and seen her grow up and they live in California. And whenever they used to come to Bombay, which was occasional, they visit Chennai more, we used to have, have a meal or have a drink together. And Omar was always interested in doing something like this. And I remember talking to him about it at Bombay Gymkhana, if you remember, when we went and had a meal. And it's a hard work, a lot of painstaking time. You have done this remarkably well. And finally, the day has come when, uh, when you put everything together. I don't know how many hours you have toiled with this and how much research you have done on this, but uh, it's a remarkable effort. And thank you for sharing us our own city, giving us. Thank you. Thank you. Maharaja of Jaipur, for example, his image would be on the left, and then you would have it sent 
in a local language. And I've actually found postcards in America written in obscure languages from Rajasthan, which I would send here. My mother and I would find somebody in the bazaar who knew that language and could translate. So, and many of those have not survived. And I'm not a great collector of those, but I have, you know, a couple of hundred. So yes, that kind of imagery did filter down you know, on the one side. So there's a certain kind of card. The other thing is you had many cards that, again, did not survive in the same way that these cards that went to the elite survived. Because they were put in albums, they were stored in nice conditions, you know, how humid it is, you know, there are a lot of other factors that go on. But I think it was very soon that the cards were taken over and used by people for their own purposes. And a lot of cards were actually, you know, uh, I mean, Hindu gods and goddesses, for example, were very popular cards, uh, extremely popular and very beautiful cards. With Basi and Sons, for example, made not only spectacularly painted cards by you know Rajasthani artists, then photographed, then hand colored, then beautiful little gold dust and everything sprinkled on top of them, and then sold, and those were then framed and put in people's houses. So you know, postcards were appropriated by many different levels of society in their own ways. So I, I you know, I, I, I do not have researched this extensively, but I do think that the medium became something that was used in different ways in all parts of uh, society. So, so uh, actually, I was going to ask a very similar question, uh, as I mentioned to you earlier also. But uh, did was there some kind of social consciousness that developed as because the image was so ubiquitous, so it's what I said a little bit at the, in the introduction, was there at any point did you did you find, or have you noticed, uh, a didactic intention or a political intention? Um, we do see upstairs, you know, the, the freedom movement, the images from the freedom movement. Um, and, um, and as, as Rahab mentioned, the plague, you know, those images of the plague. So did you find that as it became a medium of mass, of enormous mass distribution, that it became also then a tool. Um, and you know, so this is a sort of a little bit of sort of extension in the sense of how this constitution. And my answer would be yes, yes, and yes. By 1903 you had Tilak postcards all over the city. And he was a very, you know, energizing political figure. I think in a very crude way, if I could put it like this, and I, so I think a little more well argued in the book, but the postcard went from a tourist object that depicted India in a certain way, made by foreigners, into a tool of the independence movement um, within 20 years. And you can see upstairs all the postcards from all the different independence you know, fighters, all of them were celebrated on postcards. From 1917 on, you had a whole bunch of postcards that, you know, I mean, actually advocated for India's independence. You had people from India sending postcards abroad, trying to tell their friends abroad in Australia and England, you must support the independence movement, and using the postcard with political messages to do so. So, you know, images are slippery objects. You can use them the way you want. And I think people very quickly here adopted the postcard as a, as a tool to do something with it. And even the founding of the Ravi Varma Press had a political aspect to it. And the Schleicher, the German fellow that I showed you before, who ran the press, he gave, a, he gave an interview in 1906 to a German uh, magazine in the paper trade. And he mentioned to the interviewer that, look, the reason we were so successful in India was that the people hated the British, and we were Germans, and they knew that Germans were the most anti-British people in Europe, so they asked us to come in and actually set up the press for So, you know, there were political strands in all of these things, and there were, you know, people trying to you know, do what they wanted, and I think the postcard came along. Okay, I think we open it up now to the House. Are there any questions? Would somebody like to comment? Uh, Omar, I have a question. As in, amongst the, all the cards that you have collected, did all have actually um, travel across continents and come back to you, or come back to the place where you collected them from? Uh, or, and did they survive this sort of um, transfer and transportation? And in what condition are they? And or are they just reproductions of the original? Or um, and, and do, or do you have others which were not used and were collector's items? So that's a really good question, and there's a little 
That's actually a really good question. A postcard is a very humble object. And they were often damaged and bent and made discolored and so forth. And I think one of the things that I've done in this book and the way it did distinguish from many postcard books is we've restored the postcard. So I've always taken the original and sent it to a professional who's restored it as best as possible to the original state, even keeping the writing and so forth. That's the way to bring back the beauty of many of these cards. So they're always all original. And you'll see upstairs, the cards are in different conditions. But you still can find really beautiful cards because somebody bought them and put them in the album, and the color is not faded. So it's a whole sort of game of calibration, and that's part of the fun. Uh, but I think restoring postcards gives a way uh, of letting you see what they actually were meant. So you have all the I have the, I have this. I have all the original. We restore them digitally. So we, we make a scan, a high resolution scan, and then it's digital, a digital restoration that ends up in the book. It's up to you. Uh, can we get a mic here, please? Who's my can you just take charge? She actually shares her hand first. Hi, well, okay. I'm just curious about how you date postcards because most postcards actually, I mean, they don't give any indication of uh, when they were uh, published or produced. Okay, yes, and you date them by finding other versions of that postcard that actually have been sent and have a date stamp on them. That's one method. The other method is knowing the way different technologies and styles changed. And that gives you another sense of you know, when the dating might be and when the divided back postcard where you could put a message in the back happened in 1905, say in India. That's another way of dating. But it is also a game of estimation. And it can be very difficult to be sure. And that's why often in the book we have you know, CAs and circa around a certain year. And certainly we can make mistakes there. But you know, there's the general sense of when different kinds of cards came along that gives you sort of a range uh, to play with. But yeah, it's really great fun to try and find the postcard and see when it was date stamped and get a sense of how early it might be. Yes? Omar, yes. could you tell us something about uh, the postcard albums? Uh, these albums are actually beautiful yes. and works of art, some of them in their own right. Yes. And uh, how did the whole, uh, even the album collecting, I mean, obviously families treasure these albums and means to sort of show up places that they do well. Yeah, so let me just correct and ask three questions. One thing that I forgot to mention in the talk is that collectors were also a big driver of this industry from day one, and often they were women. And they would then, they valued the postcards that they bought for their beauty, and they put them in albums. And they would make really, they would buy really beautiful albums. You have, I think, eight or nine upstairs, which are open, and you can sort of see the very nice pages that you put postcards in. So yes, albums were the, you know, if you have something that you treasure, you want to put it in something that keeps it safe. So they put these postcards in albums. What's happened today is when a dealer buys an album from a family, they'll strip all the postcards out and then sort of chuck the album to the side. So I was happy, especially in Austria, to see these albums and then buy them up because they are really beautiful. They have really beautiful covers and they're, you know, whatever images of distant places and they'll have some kind of you know, romantic stuff. They'll have, you know, oh, I don't know, you know, secession art pieces on the front. So it, it showed the affection with which people held. Yeah, uh, because actually, because the thing is, the normal tendency would be to discard the album and just keep the card. But now, I mean, looking back, it's a mistake. Yeah. Because the albums themselves are, you know, so evocative of the time and the whole, uh, you know, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, that's a good point. There's a question. Before we continue, I just wanted to mention one thing with regard to the dating and so on and so forth. There is that, you know, trans there is a transformation that occurs. So a photograph that might have been taken in, say, 1850 is being printed then in 1910. So the question is, when you're dating a postcard, you're actually dating the day of printing that, you know, physical object. You're not necessarily dating the photograph that is in it. So it, it is a great traveler and a maneuver of the image in any case. But to take you know, this last point a little further about, uh, about um, uh, you know, the albums and so on and so forth, um, if we are saying that, once again, the, the postcard presents this art of the everyday, and there has been a huge focus on personal narrative, personal histories, you know, memorabilia, coming to play also, as Tasneem had mentioned, a political kind of a role. 
apart from what was said on the, you know, by the postcard maker on the postcard, you are also coming into an era where there are lots of messages. Now, this is the time of, you know, the height of imperial culture, you could say, in a sense, and also the transformation of that culture. So is there a kind of meta-narrative to it? On the one hand, there's an endorsement of the state on the postcard, perhaps, but the message inside the postcard might actually be contradicting it. Have you come across such instances? Yes, I've come across both. I mean, you come across very racist messages on postcards that sort of keep track. His master's whiskey, and it is from South India, where you have a drunk servant and a bottle of whiskey. Uh, you know, it's actually a very typical kind of postcard. And you do have messages that reinforce that, and you have messages that kind of undermine that and say something different as well. Uh, so it's, you know, I mean, that's the fun or the tension of the postcard, looking at, you know, I mean, the thing about imagery is, you have the reality, you have the intention of the maker or the photographer, and then you have the consciousness of the person who's apprehended that, and they can be sometimes out of sync, mm -hmm. and they have their own you know, rights in that game. So, uh, yeah, I, I would say there are such opportunities. The French, for example, because they were always quarreling with the British, they made a lot of postcards that made the British look really foolish. Mm -hmm. And a really around famine, for example, would show pictures of you know uh, how bloated the British king was, uh, whereas the Indian people didn't have enough food. So you have these kinds of postcards made too with those messages. In this case, an overt political message from a nation as opposed to a handwritten message. But yeah, you have you know, different kinds of things come up. Yeah. I forgot uh, the two uh, yes, postcards that really stood out as different. I thought were the two one uh, of the famine. You know, because the otherwise postcards are the pretty pictures. And then yes. you have these two. Can you tell us a little more about it? We were really intrigued to see those two. Yes. So the famine postcard was a very, so here's a good example. You have famine postcards like the one you saw. Sometimes you would have a really condescending message like, oh, look at these people. I wouldn't like to meet them on the street or something like that. Why can't they get a good food for themselves? I've seen messages like that. And then you've seen other messages like, oh, what a mess we're making of this place. So you could see the same postcard put in two different places. Then you had a thing with the Madras or Deccan family on the top. Uh, it's hard to say without a message behind. You just have something in the back that says, you know, famine in whatever it was, 1890, 1910, or something like that, with nothing else taken by it. But you just have to wonder what was the intentionality of the person sending the message. Now, some of these postcards were sent by Christian missionaries back home to raise funds for whatever they were undertaking. So there was that kind of a sense. So it was, in a sense, condescending, but you also were getting money to bring food to these people, so you, you can look at it different ways. Uh, but you have a multiple sort of levels of these. I would say I don't have enough of like maybe 50 or 100 such cards with messages to really make a more sort of coherent judgment about it. But I do think they were all over the place. What is the latest postcard you Oh, oldest. The, the newest, I mean, like. So, so, I mean, I sort of. The last year. Yeah. So I tried to stop in 1947, 1948, but sometimes things go a little bit beyond, yeah. So I try and do within the Raj or just after. Because I got to stop somewhere, and I think that's really one of the most interesting comments happening. Yes. Why don't you go ahead? Why don't you go ahead? Yeah. The question is to both of you, actually. So it's got to do with the. Uh, the space that you designed. Um, the whole aesthetic is a very 1900 uh, postcard era, and then you also have uh, television screens with your video playing. So why, uh, why did you make that choice, and how did you come to that decision to kind of break and also juxtapose it, you know, its own kind of way? How did you come to that? Well, we were deliberately trying to confuse you, that's what I mean. <laughs> yeah. um, No, one has to sort of uh, think about, well, I, I, I think, well, maybe there's an anecdote or really a relationship that Umar had brought up the other day. He said that if Gerhard or another individual who had made these postcards had the opportunity to enlarge them the way we have, would they have done so? Could they have even imagined that an image that was that size would eventually become you know, 30 feet large or, or whatever it is, 10 feet large. And when you're confronted with um, technology and media, the idea is to use it because you, innovations of any particular kind will always lead to new 
as if we're new image frontiers and new image horizons. And we're trying to address transformations in media and so we, and let the 19th century speak in ways that it has not imagined that it could speak. Because if everything was about you know creating a context and retaining it in that context, then the contemporary would not be able to voice its concerns, either its challenges, you know, or its sort of or the future that are about to confront us. So using media becomes very, very important, and I think the constant refrain from the beginning of this uh, you know, series has been that they are also a kind of social media. They are also creating sort of new uh, dialogues amongst a uh, you know, group of people that had not created or had those dialogues to create in the past. So in a way, I would say that you know, this evolutionary track of image production also has to lead on into the contemporary. And then for us, not only look back upon it as a point of return, but to see the 19th century as a point of initiation and innovation. That's perhaps what we were trying to do. That's certainly something that Omar was very keen to do. Yeah, I would say that's a very perceptive question. I think the idea was to convey as much information as possible in as small a space, and the videos added a means of doing that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So one two things. One is that you know, thank you for bringing Gurinder into the mainstream debate because you know he's always been overshadowed with Ravi Varma all the time. <laughs> and it's a, it's, a, it's a time to reassess and we look and we investigate. So I think you know uh, thank you for doing that. I think that really uh, brings a different aspect of Gurinder into uh, you know in front of people and then ask questioning about certain narratives that we put forward. So that's one thing. The second, the, the second I would like to know is that you know you uh, know about Ravi Varma, you know about Gurinder, but but there any artists from Bengal school who also came into like, making postcards? I mean, that has been, you know, I, I, mean, I could see in the part of the exhibition or people. So were there any uh, efforts at the Because that, it was as political as what was happening in the Yes, case. yes. And so that also ties into the question of uh, were cards made for within the Indian population. So since I live abroad, most of the cards I collect have been sent abroad. And there is a lack of those kinds of cards, specifically, I think, abroad. And there was a lot more happening in Bengal that I've been able to see. And I think that's one area that I still have to get into. Calcutta Art Studio, which I have a number of cards from, for example, was one such place that they did have some cards. But I would just say from what, what I can tell from my vantage point abroad, it was not as rich as the production that was happening here uh, in the city. But I think that's something that still needs to be researched and looked into. Uh, more, care more carefully. So I think it, it's very much about what this museum was also about, that documentation of people of India, you know, and which, uh, which, uh, which we have been working on. Um, and I think that is very much a Bombay initiative, a school of art initiative, especially with Cecil Bowens. So, um, and, and, and that, and that as, as you well know. Uh, so Himanshu has curated that we both together curated, but I think he deserves all the credit because he put that he's been thinking about these all, all, all the all the all the, uh, the research effort. Um, uh, so it's very much about that. That that was it was an interesting thing which I think happened primarily in Mumbai as a result of the school of art and it completely followed as you know the, the people of India um, the book really. Any other questions? Yeah. I just want to push the discussion in a slightly different direction. Uh, this is not a mere criticism, it's a little observation. Uh, from whatever I've seen here, I noticed that there is a significant absence of three types of portrayals. The city of Bombay was built around businesses in three commodities, cotton, opium, and yarn, all of which went to just one place, China. Uh, I am struck by the mere absence of any postcard on this subject. Can you just throw light on this, please? So the book has a number of postcards around the cotton trade. Uh, so I think cotton was depicted in many, many different ways on postcards. The opium trade was, there are a couple of postcards of opium shops, but not very many. 
And uh, so that's an imitation, perhaps, of the postcard and what it showed. But I do have a few. I don't think there's any in the book, though. And then what, what was the third? Uh, yes. I don't know how many such postcards. There, was a, there are a lot of postcards of the jute industry, actually, uh, which I do have. But I think postcards within the mills here in the city, not that common that I uh, actually know of. But the cotton trade was certainly well depicted on postcards. Uh, in, in the postcards that you've seen on Tokyo, is there a portrayal of a sense of shame? No. <laughs> so, but I think, but, but there, there's, there's not. And I don't think that, uh, yeah, I would not say there was. So I think it's we we now five minutes past our time. So I'd like to just thank all of you. Um, thank you, Laura uh, and Rahab. Thank you, Pat. And all of you for, for being here. 